working up here so hard for our public. If you could start on this end. Alicia Reese, Vice President, Hamilton County Commission. County Commissioner Denise Driehaus. Jeff Alito, County Administrator. Mike Freeman, Legal Counsel of the Board. Thank you guys very much. Stephanie Summerall Dumas, President of the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners. We have several items on here today and we'll get started. Uh, first, we have a resolution. I don't know if Holly's here because we're going to see if Holly wants to say something uh, when we finish. <laughs> We have a resolution in front of us, a resolution appointing a member to the Community Action Agency of Cincinnati and Hamilton County Board of Directors. I just wanted to make sure I had Holly's and not the other one. And I'll just read a little bit of it. It says, by the board, whereas the Cincinnati Hamilton County Community Action Agency serves as an advocate, provider, and facilitator for the full range of public and private resources, programs, and policies which give low to moderate income individuals the opportunity to improve the quality of life for themselves, their families, and their communities. And whereas the Board of County Commissioners is responsible for the selection of two representatives to serve on the Cincinnati Hamilton County Board of Agency Board of Directors, and whereas Holly Christman, you can come up because I'm going to ask you to say something because you've been on it for a while. Uh, whereas Holly Christman, Hamilton County Assistant Administrator, has expressed a willingness to accept reappointment as one of the two Board of County Commissioners representatives. Um, her appointment expired 12-31-2020. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of County Commissioners of Hamilton County uh, hereby appoint as a member to the Hamilton County Community Board of uh, Agency of Cincinnati, Holly Christman, be it further resolved by the Board of County Commissioners that the clerk of this board be and hereby is directed to certify copies of this resolution to the appointee and the community action agency. I actually read the whole thing, but anyway, <laughs> uh, adopted at a regularly adjourned meeting of the Board of County Commissioners, Hamilton County, Ohio, this 28th day of September. And here is Holly Christman. Let's give her a hand. Would you Thank like you, to Madam say President. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's an honor to um, hopefully continue my service on the board of the Community Action Agency. It's been a pleasure over the past couple of years to get to know the organization, uh, learn more about what they do, what their impact is, and I look forward to, if approved by the board, to continuing that service. Thank you so much. Would you, anyone like to make a comment? I just wanted to uh, say uh, to thank Holly and certainly our new appointee. This is important appointment because of all the work that the Community Action Agency uh, does and have done over the years, and particularly at a time right now uh, when we have even more people uh, that need help. So it really helps us to have uh, good board members to be on, and Holly being with us and what we're doing uh, through for COVID-19 and then be connected at the table with the Community Action Agency, I think is important. So i um, happy to support uh, both of these appointments and just wanna let people know this is two important uh, positions to have, particularly at a time right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Now I'm happy to support the resolution. I'm Holly's done a fine job and I too appreciate the connectedness between the city and CAA as we move through some of the funding sources to move out into the community. So thanks, Holly. Thank you. And Holly, meet your partner. You'll be, I'm going to introduce her in a minute, Ronice Handy. So I thank you so much. I a few minutes ago. I can't wait to get to know oh, her. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going, going to, before I make a motion, I'll put both of the resolutions together. But we have another person who's willing to become a member of the Cincinnati Community Action Agency, and that is Ron Ronice Handy. I'll skip down and say, whereas Ronice Handy, Chief Financial Officer of the City of Cincinnati Fire Department has expressed a willingness to accept appointments as one of the two Board of County Commissioner representatives, um, filling a position which expired 12-31-2018. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of County Commissioners uh, that Ronice Handy, and it has her address, is hereby appointed as a member of the Cincinnati Hamilton County Community Action Agency be it further resolved by the Board of County Commissioners that the clerk of this board is directed to certify copies of this resolution adopted at the regular adjourned meeting of the Board of County Commissioners, Hamilton County, Ohio, this 28th day of September. And what I'd like to say, um, 
before we bring Ms. Handy up, who wanted to say a, a few words, is that um, I want to thank my chief of staff, uh, Bishop Hilton, who, when we got hold of all the appointments and the ones that have expired, he's been making it his mission to get up to date to where we need to be on vacancies and trying to fill those vacancies, because we've said many times that boards and commissions are critical to uh, the, the county and what we, as we move forward, including residents in this process. So I just want to thank uh, my chief of staff for his hard work, and we'll be passing it on to somebody else uh, sooner or, or later anyway. So I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Ronice Handy if you'd like to come up and say a few words. Good afternoon to this most distinguished panel. <laughs> I'm you. so pleased to be here yeah. and so just so honored to be assigned this appointment. I want to thank you so much for your support on this particular appointment, and I hope to bring a synergy from the city as well as just a local government perspective that will be helpful. Thank you so very much. Thank you. So let's give her a hand. And I, I'll just say I, I want to thank you, Ms. Handy, for your patience because uh, your application has been uh, in, the, in the pot for about a year and a half, and you continued to call and see where you could fit in. And um, so I'm glad that we were able to do that. I knew Ms. Handy years ago from Lincoln Heights as the financial consultant uh, for Lincoln Heights and did an impeccable job, so just very professional. So thank you so much. Um, Vice President Reese. Congratulations and thank you for willing to serve. Um, these boards uh, are volunteer boards, but they're very important. And uh, again, particularly at a time right now, uh, Community Action Agency is critical in our uh, entire county. And so I think bringing uh, your uh, expertise as a CFO at the uh, fire department would be great. And I'll be remiss, I'm, I'm watching you, you video your phone and uh, I know some people probably are watching out there. Uh, she's also a member of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, <laughs> so I, I thought I better mention that for my Delta uh, friends that are out there. Um, but again, uh, thank you for your service, and you're going to be playing a, you and Holly will be playing a major role uh, on our behalf to make sure uh, that children and families are, are helped in these very tough times of need. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Well, thank you, and welcome to the county. Uh, thank you for being willing to serve on this important board. Uh, there's been no more important time, really, with our relationship between the county and CAA because we're doing so much in conjunction with them trying to provide relief uh, because of COVID-19. So thank you for be being willing to step up and take on the responsibility. So again, welcome to the county. Thank you, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Holly just, to, just for a minute. Uh, because as we know, Holly has been handling all the CARES Act, ARP funding, along with her regular duties, and she um, was unselfish enough to say, uh, I'll go on and be a part of CAA again. Even, I mean, it would have been easy. Maybe she said it in the background, so it would have been easy to say, no, I don't want to do it again. So for extending yourself in, in that area, so I certainly appreciate it. At this time, I'd like to make a motion I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolutions appointing two members to the um, Community Action Agency of Cincinnati and Hamilton County Board of Directors. Ms. Holly, oh God, I forgot her name. Christman. Holly Christman, I think it's this mask, but you know, we, we do what we need to do. Holly Christman and Ronice Handy. Second. You sure someone is in that? Yes. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. One. You know, I think it's a mental thing. You think you can't hear, you think you can't see. It's like, I can't, I need to take my mask off to be able to see. But anyway, we're all good. Thank you, thank you, ladies. So we'll, we'll move forward to the next item on our agenda, which is a comprehensive update on COVID-19 spread and vaccine distribution. Uh, Commissioner Greg Hesterman, thank you. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me again today. I am uh, happy to report that several of the metrics have actually calmed down a little bit, and a couple of them are actually heading in the right direction. So month after month, we've been talking about the wrong direction. So it, it is happy to be able to share a little bit of bright news. 
When looking at Hamilton County, most likely later this afternoon, we will hit the 100,000 threshold for cases here in Hamilton County, if not today, certainly by tomorrow. So it is just a, another moment of reflection of how much uh, COVID we have experienced. And, uh, you know, the other numbers up there, I think last week, Commissioner Duma, uh, D uh, Sumero Dumas mentioned about these truly being people, not just numbers. And, you know, 3,700 3, hospitalizations and nearly 1,500 deaths within Hamilton County has certainly been an impact. When looking at active cases in Hamilton County, just one week ago, I reported 9,100 active cases of COVID-19. This week, I report 8,900. So less active COVID in our community, still a very big number, still very concerning, but certainly I will take every opportunity to share success. Looking at it a little bit differently, um, our peak, most recent peak was on September 16th. We had about 419 cases. We are now today at 315 cases on a seven day average. So also heading in the right direction. You can see though, I mean, throughout the pandemic, there have been, there have been some dips and things come right back up. So no need to celebrate yet, but certainly um, things are heading in the right direction. Percent positivity for Hamilton County also continues to decline slightly. For the region, we are at 10.5% positivity. And for Hamilton County, we are at 10.6% positivity. The other hopeful item is that we continue to have a lot of testing in Hamilton County, nearly as much as we did back in December. A large part of the access to testing was made possible through the county commissioners and the test and protect program. Folks are out there getting tested, which is good news. If you're sick, we want you to keep sick at home. I've had questions about if you are vaccinated and you are exposed to COVID-19, should you quarantine? The vaccine prevents you from having to quarantine. You're allowed to go out and continue to do things, but we strongly recommend you wear your mask during that period of time. The good news though is because we have testing, you can also test and reassure yourself that you don't have COVID. In, um, <clears throat> with regards to reproductive numbers, as you see those cases start to die off a little bit, our reproductive number will drop below zero, or I'm sorry, below one. So today for Hamilton County, we are at 0 0.91. For the region, we are at 0 0.90. So shifting now to the hospitalizations, which has really been one of those numbers that we watch for two reasons. One is when you need to get hospitalized, there's no, there's no denying that you have COVID and there's no hiding it. We know with cases, sometimes folks don't get tested. They don't want to get tested, but hospitalizations is a pretty true number to what's happening within our community. The other reason is clearly hospitalizations, we have limited capacity. And so we watch this very closely. <clears throat> Today in Hamilton County, we have 535 people within the hospitals. And I, I just threw up another little chart that shows that you can see that over the last 30 days, things have kind of started to plateau a little bit. They're heading in the downward direction, maybe not as quick as we'd like to see, but certainly much better than the continued growth that we've had. With regards to intensive care unit admissions, we are at 164. We continue to see those rise. Um, they stayed within the statistical threshold, that gray shaded area. But over the last five days, you can kind of see that they're starting to make a line potentially in the right direction. Too early to say that it matters, too early to say that there's a, a statistical downward trend, but certainly um, a little bit of hope. <clears throat> as far as hospital admissions, who is ending up in the hospital, we continue to see, oops, excuse me, we continue to see those between the ages of 50 and 79 within the hospital systems with the greatest impact for those between the ages of 60 and 69. As mentioned uh, on different days, the entire line represents the state of Ohio and the dark shade represents Southwest Ohio. As far as the Centers for Disease Control and level of community transmission, the entire state of Ohio remind, remains in high community transmission. Hamilton County has 297 cases per 100,000 with a percent positive uh, rate as already mentioned at 10.6. <clears throat> so finally, we see the uh, percentage point for those over the age of 12 go up another point. We are at 69% today. Last week we were at 68%, so that's good news. And when you look at the total population, we are at about 56.5%. So we continue to see folks getting vaccinated. Another way to present this data, the regional goal 
is 80%, and we have been successful at meeting that goal for everyone over the age of 65. <clears throat> in addition, we're getting kind of close for the 60 to 64 year olds and the 50 to 59 year olds. We are starting to inch up closer. And then uh, we are hopeful that in the coming weeks, the FDA will approve a vaccine for those that are five to 11. And uh, we can start to make some progress for the zero to 19 year olds. The last slide that I have deals with the booster shots. In Ohio, these became available officially on Saturday afternoon. Any um, of the providers in Hamilton County are providing booster shots, and they are available for anyone who received Pfizer vaccine. We are still waiting on the FDA to review the Moderna for boosters, and as well as the Janssen. Those boosters are currently available to those that are 65 years of age or older, anyone over the age of 18 with an underlying medical condition, and anyone that works in a high-risk setting, and that is self-defined meaning if you are working a job as a receptionist and you feel that's a, a high risk setting, our clinics will accept you for a booster shot. Last, just a reminder, we have lots of access in Hamilton County, throughout the county, more than 100 sites in our county, more than 200 sites in our region. So if somebody wants vaccine, um, there are walk-up spots today. I would encourage you to go out and get your vaccine, whether it's your first dose or you need a booster. Mm -hmm. That is all I have prepared, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Kesterman. I just want to thank you and your staff for all your hard work and your flexibility. I see you everywhere. You're getting interviews everywhere and ma uh, making yourself accessible to the community. So I certainly appreciate that. Vice President Reese. Uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Kesterman. And uh, it's good to get some good news because I know you were <laughs> <laughs> the other ones you were like oh boy here we go again that's right and um do i do have a question how do we compare I, uh, i've been hearing a lot about kentucky which is right across our our border um is there, they were kind of higher than we are in uh, those uh vaccination numbers is there anything that you found with that that we should be doing or we are doing or why is that there has been, when you look at the um, counties in the, four, the 14 counties in Southwest Ohio, the three counties in Kentucky have been reporting higher than Hamilton County. Although just this week, there's been some discussion about data. And so they're looking to see if that data is accurate. They've been running, so we're at 69% today, and I believe they've been around 72%. Um, certainly very similar strategies as far as vaccination goes. Uh, thank you. And I wanted to just, um, uh, also, thank you for the partnership. We have a, I think, a pretty robust um, mobile operation with um, with our county, both with uh, the vans and uh, our 513 relief bus. Well, I think, from what I've been here, we're doing more non-traditional than most counties, and even over in Kentucky. I mean, you've been at the movie theaters, to the parks, or uh, to breweries. And um, just wanted to reiterate that we have the test kits uh, now and that uh, uh, your uh, Department of Health are the nurses now with the 513 relief bus. And we've been getting some pretty good numbers. I saw and uh, we were in Norwood, people were lined up all around the block to a lot of them to get the shot. Um, in one of the areas, I think we did almost close to 80 uh, shots. So it's kind of going up. Um, and so I just wanna just remind people that they also could go today. Uh, we're gonna be in North College Hill from three to 6 p.m. today. And then we're in Carthage from 1.30 to 4 uh, p.m. I believe on Thursday. And at New Prospect Baptist Church, uh, kicking off breast cancer awareness, um, which will happen on this Saturday at 11 a.m. But they can still go to 513relief.org. Uh, Bridget, to make sure I remind people of that to get all of the places that you can go. But more people now are asking for those free um, kits, testing kits that you advised us last time to have one at home just in case you're feeling a certain kind of way. So um, thank you for that. And you've, you've trained me with my talking points and that's what I tell people to do. <laughs> I said, my health commissioner said, you gotta get one of these kits and hold it in the house. Yep, right. <laughs> so thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Thanks, as always, Kesterman, um, Commissioner Kesterman, for being here. So I, I wanted to expand a little bit upon um, the availability of the at-home test kits. They're available at the library as supplies last, and I know they've been running out. 
but then they go back up to Columbus, get more, and now they're available again. Um, where else are those home test kits available? So you're able to get the free test kits, as you mentioned, at the libraries. I think there's seven or eight locations around Hamilton County. In addition, any of the mobile units, including the 513 bus or the three mobile units that my team operates throughout the county, you would find those locations on our, the my mobile units. You can find them on testandprotectcincy.com, or it might be easier just to look on our website, which is hcph.org. And then there's a whole bunch of paid test kits as well that are accessible. You can look at your typical pharmacies and other locations like that if you wanted an at-home test kit. Great, thank you. And that's in addition to the testing that Test and Protect is doing at different locations and as we've been doing for, I guess, a year and a half now. Um, the one other question I have, so the boosters come out for Pfizer. We're waiting on Moderna. Do you have any guesstimate as to when we might see the booster available for Moderna? In the media, it looks like in the next few weeks, we would anticipate that booster becoming available, but I don't have a, a real strong date from the Centers for Disease Control or FDA at this time. Okay, great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And I read somewhere uh, the forward thinking as it relates to the vans and also our bus with the weather changing, uh, hopefully not too much snow, but our uh, ability to get to the places that we would normally be able to get to and how do we strategically look at a plan to make sure it doesn't stop the efforts of either us or your health department to make sure people still get what they need. So it was good to, good to read that. So Absolutely. Vice President Reese, did you? Oh, I just wanted to highlight to the booster, which I learned, I guess, we're giving those also with the mobile units as well. So you can get it at the van or the bus. Mm, that's uh, correct. The boost, yeah, because I saw some people show up and said, I got a booster and I'm looking at the bus. And they're like, yeah, they're giving the boosters out. So. You can also get the boosters. You're providing those as well, right? That's right. And I, I believe pretty much of the more than 100 providers in Hamilton County, all of them are offering the booster shot. Mm -hmm. um, the bus, if you go, you may recall the mobile units, we still are offering $100 gift cards for your first vaccine. That does not apply to the booster. Only your first vaccination are we providing those gift cards. But they're still available. There's plenty of Visa $100 gift cards if folks haven't been vaccinated. This is just one more opportunity to give you some encouragement. Mm -hmm. And that's good. I, I did hear someone say that. They said, I got my shot. I, I said, no, they're not giving anything out for boosters. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. But that was good. People did come to get the boosters. And I just wanted to make sure you highlighted that too. Yep. Okay. Thank you so I, much. I'm Appreciate ready. it. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, just real quick on the booster, uh, uh, Commissioner Kesterman. So we've got a lot of staff, obviously, in the county who uh, do things that probably would fall. Um, very definitively into that high risk, whether it's sheriff's deputies, uh, children's services workers, building inspectors, those types of things who are out in the public um, interfacing with people, et cetera. As we look to get them some guidance on this, is there any uh, timeline associated with the booster as it relates to distance from your second shot? That we should advise them on? Yeah, great question. So the booster shot, you may recall the third dose which is for people specifically with immunocompromised uh, or uh, immune system issues or a few other specific diseases, the third dose is 28 days after your second shot. When we talk about boosters and that enhanced uh, uh, immune system response, we're talking six months after mm -hmm. the second shot was received. Okay. Not six months after the two weeks that you had to wait before you were fully uh, mm -hmm. uh, vaccinated. But six months after the shot itself. That's correct, oh, yes. Okay. Thanks for asking that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. We'll move forward to our next item on the agenda, Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. So Harry, that's Good it. afternoon, Commissioners. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us mm -hmm. here today, Madam President. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, my name is Harry Blanton. I'm with HCDC, the County's Economic Development Office. Um, with me today are uh, Liz Bloom with the Community Building Institute, Steve Johns with the Hamilton County Planning and Development Department, and Clip McIntosh with HCDC. Some in our audience might be wondering what is the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy? So there are two main purposes of the SEDS. We also call it the SEDS for short. Um, it is a document that provides a blueprint for Hamilton County's economic development strategy for the next five years. It is also a reference used by the US Economic Development Administration to ensure that applicants for EDA grants are following the county's strategy. The documents that we provided today are the results of input from citizens, government officials, business leaders, educators, and economic development practitioners, to name a few. 
This also includes the Port Authority and Ready Cincinnati, who are your economic development agencies, as well as HCDC. Uh, the process included four public meetings to get input from general public, as well as interviews with stakeholders. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Liz Bloom with the Community Building Institute to, to present a PowerPoint presentation with more details. Okay. And then after that, I'll come back and make some closing comments. And Steve Johns and I are here to answer any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good Tony afternoon. Commission, thank you so much for having me. I always am happy to be here. Um, are you telling me? Yep, thank you. I got it. <laughs> um, my name is Liz Bloom. I work at the Community Building Institute um, at Xavier University. And I'm very happy to have been a partner with um, HCDC staff and the Hamilton County Planning and Development staff. We all worked on this together. And I'm driving, right? Um, so here I spent a little bit of time talking about process. We certainly interview stakeholders in the community local elected officials, local appointed officials, folks from all of the economic development entities in the county. Um, and it was very helpful. I wanna also let you know that Hamilton County Planning and Economic Development in particular did a lot of demographic, social, economic market research that went into the document you have in front of you. Um, and Harry talked about the objectives. I think the objective is you're certainly responding to federal funding agencies who want to know that the county has a framework for economic development. It is also, um, it, this can be kind of a perfunctory exercise. And I always present, appreciate that Hamilton County takes this as a really good opportunity to step back, connect with stakeholders, spend more than a minute talking about what the county is doing, what they should be looking forward to in the future, um, and, and I think have done a pretty robust job, so I appreciate that. Um, so we talk about economic strengths, and the strengths that are, I think, identified here are strengths that would seem familiar to us from a long time, right? We have a very strong Fortune 500 segment in our economy. We have a diverse economy. We've talked about that as a strength for a very long time. Today, we can talk about successful urban core revitalization, and I think in lots of ways, this region looks to be um, a model for other Midwestern cities around core revitalization. We've certainly got market competitiveness around our location. Um, we are becoming a climate safe zone, which is maybe a new thing on the list. Um, we don't have the same kind of climate um, problems that other communities do. We certainly have our own heat and flooding. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think corporations are looking to places that are off of coasts, away from fire zones, uh, to do business expansion, and that is us. Um, there are threats that were identified, and I will say to you that much of the research that we conducted was done pre-COVID. Um, we identified at the time a poor transportation system. We think the passage of the Metro levy is a huge step forward and a really positive development. We identified high poverty rates before COVID. We have high poverty rates today. Um, we know that a lot of the um, job growth we have is in low wage jobs, and that creates some issues. It creates uneven market performance across the county. There are places that are doing really well, and what we know from the market and demographic research is that the county was in a very good position in 2019. We were stabilizing, we were growing jobs, we were growing population, and all of that are positive trends. Um, I think that even post COVID that's true, all of that, but what we understand is that we don't have um, even market performance across all sectors. Um, a relatively slow population growth, a population growth, a snow, slow population growth. Um, to some extent, lots of Midwestern communities that are showing strong or more stronger growth than we are are attracting a larger immigrant population than we are. Um, we know that there are some economic liabilities around infrastructure, um, bridges, storm and sanitary separations. There are plenty of infrastructure needs that need to be addressed um, to make sure that we have a strong economy for the businesses that locate here. Um, so one of the things that we like that we're presenting in the plan, and I think is is a, a more robust way to think about what does success look like. We certainly always count employment numbers and unemployment rates, and that's appropriate. We're suggesting that population growth, educational advances, um, wage growth, income growth, poverty reduction, racial parity, and business establishments are also important metrics. Um, one of the things that you sometimes can miss 
when you're counting job numbers is that some of those jobs are low wage jobs and we're not really growing incomes. And so this is a more robust, I think, way to look at um, success and to find out where uneven growth is showing itself. So there are recommendations presented in the document in four big categories. Some of these look familiar to an economic development report, some maybe not so much. We're talking about human development, physical development, business development, and regional development. If I could summarize in one word the interviews with the dozens of people that we interviewed um, in the, the process, it would be talent. Prior to COVID and now everybody was talking about attracting talent, attracting employees. And so human development seems like a really important part of this equation in economic terms, maybe more so than in past years when we have done this work. Um, talent attraction, that means finding folks who have background in STEM and STEAM. STEAM, include, or STEAM includes art technology. Um, Pat Longo from HCDC will talk about our uh, engineering geek in Hamilton County and that we really need to build on folks who have expertise in these areas to support the company's profiles that we have. Um, so attracting talent, and I think often people when they say that mean attracting folks from outside, and that's important, but I think equally important is to grow the career pathways of existing businesses and to grow our own residents so they become the talent that supplies the economic engine of the region. So I'm gonna kind of highlight these <laughs> to go through every single thing. So I think talent attraction, growing pathways to good jobs inside our existing businesses and being very cognizant of working with our existing employ or, uh, education sector to grow our own talent. So physical recommendations are very typical of what you would see in an economic development report. They're appropriate here. Uh, we we're talking about, and I really want to spend a minute on this, um, Hamilton County is a developed county. It's the center core county of this region, and so it's often hard to find good redevelopment sites. I'll tell you there are lots of redevelopment sites in all the suburban communities all over this county. They might be obsolete retail space. They might be obsolete schools or churches or other kinds of, of places that are going to need reuse. So it's not like developing a greenfield, but there are lots of opportunities and we need to be really conscious of helping local communities make those redevelopment opportunities work. Um, support underperforming commercial, industrial, residential, and institutional real estate. Um, there is also, and I think in some ways when we see the success that downtown has had, we understand that creating um, livable communities is a part of an economic development strategy. It might have sounded like um, fluff or icing on the cake to say we want to concentrate on parks and open space and walkability, but I think to attract talent, which our corporate sector is telling us we need to do, we understand that this becomes a more important part of an economic development strategy. Um, I think so all of this sort of gets rolled into one thing, which is we need to focus on redevelopment opportunities that create space, that support public transportation, and also provide um, amenities to all of our jurisdictions. Focus on business districts, town centers, positive image and amenity. All of that is about taking advantage of our obsolete real estate in community centers and all over the county in ways that actually produce positive change. Business development recommendations are fairly, um, fairly common to see in an economic development report. It's important to make sure that we're supporting our Fortune 500s, that we're supporting um, our stage two mid-sized companies. In other words, taking companies from 25 employees to 250 employees and to 1,000 employees. And there are different strategies that are identified in the document to do those things. Also still connected to startups, particularly minority small business startups, female-owned startups, LGBTQ community companies, all of those. And, and I will tell you, um, and I think this, this go-round, we were also engaged last time we did this, there are a lot of um, incubator and startup um, capacity in the region. It's just about focusing and properly resourcing those organizations to do the things they do. Um, 
because as Harry says, this is the document that federal agencies and state agencies who fund look to, there certainly is a section that talks about how the county can take advantage of tax incentives, loans, bonds, grants, all of that is included in the document. Um, also to continue business retention and attraction strategies. And finally, to talk about regional recommendations, there are some there are some large regional issues, mostly around infrastructure development and the sort of capacity to do economic development that really need to be attended to. Again, the sort of levy was a big step in the right direction. Um, the kinds of infrastructure improvements that include the Western Hills Viaduct, the Brent Spence Bridge, the large scale recommendations on infrastructure that need to take place, water and sewer storm separation, all that sort of stuff. Um, a network transportation model that supports freight capacity as well. We are fast growing our freight capacity with the airport and other important hubs in this region and we need to figure out how to accommodate that sort of without swamping the highway system and the roadway system. Um, to create and enhance economic resources that help small and disadvantaged political jurisdictions. So I'm gonna go back to, to this conversation about making best use of obsolete sites and obsolete real estate. And there really are some capacity needs in small jurisdictions to help them with site assembly, with acquisition, with prep, with brownfields cleanup, all the things that we know are important to pre-development in regions particularly when we're talking about obsolete real estate that needs all that other activity before we get to a shovel in the ground. Um, and I mentioned the key infrastructure improvements, um, creating community benefit, as well as effective use of state and local or state and national funds. Um, maybe I'm gonna say one more thing about that before I leave. The county commission has indicated that through Recovery Act funds and all kinds of other funding, from a federal and state level, you're setting aside um, resources to make, I think, huge improvements in these small communities who really need this kind of support. So this feels like a really important moment, and you've, you all have stepped up in some pretty significant ways. I know there's a group of, stake, of stakeholder conversations coming up, and we hope that this can provide some kind of support to those conversations as well. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna say, it, Harry, you wanna come back up or you want me to? Commissioners, we're, we're happy to entertain your questions or comments now. Certainly. Thank you so much for your presentation. Obviously, there is a lot of work that's been done. Uh, Liz, I think you said initially when you started, this is a pre-COVID um, presentation data was taken uh, before then. I would like to see, in addition to all this great information, um, now we're not post-COVID, but we're into it even more, would any of these recommendations be different, uh, like the implementa implementation of the sort of levy? We've increased our population over 30 something thousand. So if you could possibly just take this packet and use the same packet and just write on there that solutions would be the same, recommendations would be the same, uh, I would add this recommendation so, so we can be somewhat up to date uh, for where we are now. And this is up to date. Uh, but we know we had to slow down because of COVID, but I'd like to see if anything has changed as it relates to your recommendations. We'd be happy to do that, Madam okay. President. Thank you so much. Sure you. Mm -hmm. uh, Vice President Reese. Uh, yes, before I uh, maybe might go, it might go to Jeff as well before, just a point of clarification. Is this the, when we talked about having a map of all of what's going on in Hamilton County, I think we were working, is this part of that? Uh, so we can look at kind of holistically what we're doing as it relates to development. And so we, when we start to do things in one area, how does it affect another area? Is this part of that or is this a different thing? Uh, I'm not sure if this is working real well for me, but um, uh, Commissioner, yes, this is part of that. Um, I would say that uh, the SEDS, is, as uh, Ms. Bloom said at the beginning, is it can be seen sometimes as kind of an administ administrative or perfunctory exercise that, that just go that's for the purpose of making sure we can apply for EDA grants, that type of thing. But historically, we've never looked at it that way. We've used it as more of an opportunity to touch base with stakeholders, et cetera. So the, the SEDS is the document that will go into the EDA. But to your question, what we would typically do then is Holly, and we now have additional capacity with the hiring of a senior policy uh, manager Mark Van Allman, um, we will take this document 
and turn that into, for the county's use specifically, extract out of, out of the SEDS what would be kind of a work plan, mm -hmm. uh, more of a living document for the board. And so we can, uh, as you said, Commissioner, uh, keep track of what's going on right now. But it could be, it'll be informed by a lot of the stuff that's in the SEDS mm -hmm. uh, in terms of high level um, issues, transportation, affordable housing, that type of thing. And, and I will share that there's a significant amount of mapping in this document, in the full document, and planning and development has a really rich set of data that we've been able to map here and that they can update regularly. So, right. so, so there's definitely mapping here that I think serves as that foundation. Matter yeah. for, right. I'm sorry. Can I just, before you go to the next point, because um, we got a lot of people watching and following us, uh, would you like to tell them what SEDS is and the EDAs? Because government, we love yeah. these acronyms. Yeah, so Boy. The, so <laughs> the, the SEDS is the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Uh, and EDA is the Economic Development Administration. And so maybe just to put a finer point on what I was saying, um, so we have the SEDS as this master plan, if you will, but uh, on an annual basis, what we'd like to do with the board is make sure that we're pulling out of the SEDS the things that the board would like us to be working on through our partners on an annual basis. So that mm -hmm. gets to kind of what you were talking about, Commissioner, making sure we have this kind of plan or marching orders that are driven by these high level policy mm -hmm. parameters. Okay, great. That helps me because I know we have been talking a lot about at some point we will have a, a larger mapping that I'm hoping to be interactive and technology based. So as we're making decision in one area of the county, how it affects the other area, how it affects, um, do we lose housing? Do we gain housing? Um, and that helps us as we're making these decisions so we're not in a vacuum. Someone, you know, bring you one project, it sounds great, but you have no idea if it's going to affect something somewhere else unintentionally. So we'll be able to, in a comprehensive way, know how each thing we do or we vote on how it affects the entire county. Uh, um, and that's still in the process. Yes, this correct. is not ending today. Okay. Um, I did have some, there were some um, interesting and very good findings in here. Um, and some of those things I, I do want to uh, say that uh, President Dumas, I think, is, is certainly on point with kind of updating it as it relates to now because our whole world got shook up. And there are some things that, you know, maybe are ranked higher in terms of we got to do this now versus this one might can stop. I think you also um, showed where you know, transportation, you know, we were able to pass a levy, but you said there's still challenges, which we all know. Um, and so that keeps transportation as still an issue or a barrier um, that certainly uh, work is needed. Now, when you say strengthen um, of our Fortune 500 corporations, I, I don't know if your study gets into this, um, but on your other page, you also talk about um, help and make it a better environment for diverse people. And I just wanted to look at, because I look at maybe other areas, states, and we start to see women, and um, I certainly will follow up more with this, the Greater, Cincinnati, Greater Cincinnati Foundation, they're doing a whole study on this, uh, women of color, uh, African-American women, and we're not doing quite as well as other areas, and particularly on the areas of leadership, CEOs, um, uh, salaries, even though they have education, master degrees, making less than $15 an hour. Um, and they also did a, doing a study on how much um, you need to make in order to be able to live here. Is that in your, uh, your larger, more in-depth document? It, yes. And it's, I think you're absolutely right to connect those two dots. One of the things we heard from Fortune Fives over and over and over again was they really want to have the kind of environments that will attract talent, particularly diverse talent. So those are the, those are the dots, right? And I think all the rest of that, what do communities look like? Are there affordable places for new, new folks to the community? Um, and I think that's one of the principal things, along with all the other recommendations, that larger corporations are looking for. They're looking for a welcoming, diverse community where they can attract folks to Cincinnati to work for them. 
Thank you, um, and uh, Madam President and Commissioner Driehaus. One of the things I would love to see added to this, you may have it already, um, I want to look at um, in terms of our corporate, because we have a strong corporate community, and um, based on that, some of these things should, maybe there are disconnects, uh, because we should be moving and grooving a little bit better than some of these other areas that don't have the, 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 uh, the resources in terms of that. So one of the things I wanted to look at, too, is corporate boards. I like to see CEOs. Uh, how diverse are our CEOs? How diver is there a ladder or is there a ceiling? Can we move up? I love the point that you've tied in um, education. And, um, you know, one of the things that has uh, bothered me, and I've heard from a lot of people, uh, voters out there, is that, you know, you come out of our education system, uh, both from a collegiate or a, um, uh, you know, the K through 12, but we can't move up. We always go out of town. Always the first thing we do is say, we got to do a national search. And we go out of town and we walk past the talent that we have here. There's no upward mobility. Uh, and so many people say they have to leave. And so that's one of, been one of my personal missions um, after coming back from college. A lot of my friends did not. They said, I got to go to Atlanta. I got to go to New York. I got to go to California. If a person that looks like me can move up, even with the multiple degrees, and they got people with doctor degrees, uh, you know, the PhDs all the way to the, the um, uh, master's degrees, and it was just sad to see that folks like that are still making even less than $15 or can't move up. So I'm glad you put that in here, the talent piece, and I'd love to get more information on what, um, what we might be able to do to make sure that we keep people here and spending money here, be able to work here, be able to grow here. Um, yeah, buy a house here. Keep the money here. Don't run off to California and Atlanta and New York. Uh, so I'll, I'll be very interested in that. I'm glad you kept that in under the title of economic development because you can have all the buildings in the world, but you gotta have the talent. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to add that um, um, when we ask for the extra information, yeah. if we could add that in, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Liz, Harry, and Steve for being here. Um, I too share the concern, and I think I expressed this earlier about um, the up update related to has anything changed post COVID. So I think we've all three um, suggested the same thing that there might be some um, tweaking to the report given the dynamics of COVID and what's happened to economic development, workforce, site readiness, all the rest of it. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, so related to talent, um, I think, you know, we've all focused on that. I do think it's the top priority. And so I think it's appropriate that we have a robust conversation related to the talent piece. Um, so I'm hoping that some of the things that were identified as economic threats, so particularly as it relates to talent with the uh, um, growth in low wage jobs, uneven market performance across the county, the lack of opportunities for minority residents and the region is not attracting enough immigrants, that those things especially will help inform us as we talk about workforce development with our American Rescue Plan dollars. Because we've set aside significant dollars to talk about workforce development and youth development and I'm hopeful that these things will fold together so that the research that you have done and the outreach you have done also into the community will inform some of how we invest those dollars related to economic development and workforce development. So I just want to throw that out there as maybe a nexus for us um, as we think about you know, how, how we move forward with our ARP dollars. And the other thing um, that struck me about this report was that so many of our, um, our first ring suburbs, our smaller communities, the smaller jurisdictions, I think have latent opportunities where they they know what they need, you know, they know what would catalyze the business district or, you know, they know where they need to invest, but they just don't always have the ability to, one, put together a strategic plan and, two, access partnership dollars, perhaps from the county, to allow them to move forward on those kinds of projects. Some communities are really good at this. Silverton comes to mind, uh, where they're doing a lot of leveraging and a lot of partnerships, and I applaud that. 
but not every community has either the capacity or the understanding of how even to manage that. So the, in the city, there are CDCs, these community development corporations that allow communities to kind of um, do that strategic look at what would be helpful and how to access dollars. And I had asked earlier about something similar that could be utilized for these smaller jurisdictions in the county who don't have CDCs, but maybe would benefit from a, a structure like that, that that wouldn't have to be permanent to, say, one community, but it could be maybe a shared resource amongst these smaller jurisdictions. So can you expound on that a little bit as to how the county is approaching that? Um, well, I, HCDC is, is available to help communities. Um, so we are one resource that they can access. Um, I mentioned to you earlier about the Community Improvement Corporation. It's another organization that we have under our tool belt that can help communities. Um, and also the Planning and Development Department is available. But I don't, if you're talking about a new agency that might be rotating around, I think that's something we'd probably have to talk to the county administration about to find out how that would come about. But um, again, I'm, we're, HDC is here to help. We do help a lot of communities with this on a regular basis. So. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's more maybe about um, the CIC that you refer to, maybe it is utilizing the CIC and making sure that these jurisdictions are aware of that as a resource. And, um, and then just keeping that top of mind um, as we talk to, because we're all three moving around all the time throughout the county and remembering that you know, we've got a HCDC and a CIC that is available to help these smaller jurisdictions kind of move the needle. And we just, we're um, also doing through um, our general fund some grants to communities for this very purpose. So there's a lot going on. I just think it's a matter of maybe packaging it and making sure that these jurisdictions know what's available to them as they think through, man, if we just had a little bit of assistance from the feds or the state or the county, we could really make a difference in our business district. Uh, our CDBG do dollars do this, and we just approved a round of that, but we've got other resources that have been made available in the last couple of years. General fund money, through you guys, uh, through the ARPA money. We've got all this money coming in, and I just wanna make sure that these um, jurisdictions know about it and are taking advantage of it. So I guess that's, I, I just wanted to expand a little bit on the CIC, because that was new to me. I didn't know about that, um, and I think that's a great resource. Um, so, Madam President, I think that that's all I've got. I look forward also to an update um, related to w how this looks now through the lens of, oh, we just hit a year of a pandemic, mm -hmm. and how does that change things? So, thank you. Thank you. And just one final question. Um, under economic strengths, you have the climate as a safe zone. Can you just explain that just a little bit so I can make sure I'm clear Yes. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting. So. There are, I think, and I'm, I am not, uh, not a scientist and I'm not going to predict the future, but I think that there is going to be lots of movement of companies and people based on who's in a coastal zone floodplain and who can get insurance in those kind of locations mm -hmm. and where are we going to be doing new development and this region has relatively abundant water. Mm -hmm. We are not on a coast. We are not in a fire zone, although I'm sure I'll be sorry I said that because there'll be a fire at some point. But I think that we have um, we have some 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 physical characteristics in this region that position us well for the next 20 to 30 years in terms of the kinds of things that companies have to do around insurance and around preparing for natural disasters and being equipped to handle what's coming over the next. Mm -hmm. 30 years that's all that's really long-term talk and I apologize for that but it <laughs> but it isn't often that we get to identify that kind of a physical um, positive in this region and I think it's something to pay attention to and it's something to pay attention to when we're doing corporate attraction and even population attraction okay thank you mm -hmm. Commissioner uh, Reese. yes uh, madam president I just wanted to um, Follow back up on um, Commissioner Driehaus's point. I think it was a, a good point um, and just kind of putting my marketing hat back on. But as one of the takeaways, I think for this, um, maybe there needs to be a first suburbs initiative. We got lots of initiatives, right? 
but in a package way, maybe, um, as she was saying, because I, not only do I want the, the mayors and the, the council people, the local, the trustees to know about what we're doing for villages and townships um, in the suburbs, but I want the people living there to know that we're doing these things. Uh, if you're in the know, you're dealing with HCDC and some of these other entities, um, but I want the people to know what the county is doing. So I don't know if our next budget, we may have a package, but may want to strengthen that package tied with the marketing, tied with a portal that they go to, tied with a, a whole initiative, particularly now that they are dealing with a lot of things that they had not dealt with before. People are moving outside of the city, some by choice, some by force, because they can't afford to live here. And some of the issues that maybe some of the suburbs did not have to deal with are now having to deal with without the infrastructure of help. Um, and we're starting to see that. Um, and so one of the things maybe there's, we got a list of stuff here, there, wherever, maybe there is a, uh, a focus or a name as we come up with like 513 Relief, a name, a portal, and then a measurement. So it has housing, you know, we might do a CDBG and we put in, I don't know, 10%, 15%, sometimes 20% on a, on a project. We put a little bit in here, we put a little bit in there. We, we need something we can touch and feel that everybody that's around there says, oh wow, the county did something out here and it's through their whatever the name is. We may already have a name of something, but we gotta do a better job of marketing. Uh, or maybe we rebrand it. Um, all of those things with the dollars to match it that we could roll out in these areas. Uh, if it's a storefront project, maybe it's money put away just for first suburb storefronts because we don't want empty storefronts. And you know they can, uh, they can get these dollars, but around a wraparound of things that are available, and maybe there's some extra we could put in through CARES or AURA or whatever that is, but we want to really get to stuff that not only we can touch and feel, but the people that's living there can touch and feel and know that the county played a major role. We, we're looking to play leadership roles now versus uh, we're just, we slap on our logo and you know, when you're there, wave your hand. We want to play a leadership role in helping being a partner with the first suburbs in this initiative. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of um, something that maybe uh, the short administrator and his team or whatever could get with, but I think that's the way that we want to go out there so that trustees know, mayors know, council people know, but more importantly, the people that live there know that we are here and we're, we're, we know it's important. Um, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, maybe, I know Forest Park is here and they're gonna talk more about uh, what's available. But when you go out to some of these suburb areas, I don't know if we really market all the land. I mean, we got some land that's off these highways. And yes, we're doing a great job. Downtown, Cincinnati, neighborhoods, wonderful. But we got some other areas and they got some gyms in these other areas that we really want to get our hands into. We're doing some, but we want to continue that and, and expand on it. So I just wanted to follow up Commissioner Driehaus uh, on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I agree, and I, and I think that's certainly the three of us as a board have, have been saying, uh, how do we come in in a partnership leadership way uh, so that people know what's available, maybe packaged, easy to get to, platform, technology, all of those things. Um, and then lastly, I want to make sure technology is included into this. We want to be a smart county. We're looking at broadband throughout the county. Uh, the federal government's got money. We put money. It creates jobs. It creates an industry, but it also creates, uh, helps us bridge the digital divide. So if that could be included in this, that would be great as well. Thank you. Madam President. Yes. May I just follow up briefly on that point? Because we, um, have in the past done a shared services summit, which I think is really similar to what we're talking about. In fact, planning and development were the ones that organized it and did a great job with it. And so we collected um, the jurisdictions and brought everybody together and said, 
The county wants to be a partner, and here are the opportunities to do it. And there's, there's just a huge menu of opportunity, as I like to call it. Um, and so because those opportunities have expanded, because, especially because of some of the federal money that we've received, maybe it's time to, um, and I, I, I'm looking at planning and development, uh, to maybe do another shared services summit. I, I can't see you, but I know you're smiling and jumping up and down, um, saying, yes, let's do it. Um, but it was so well received by uh, the communities. They were so grateful for the information. And so maybe that would be an opportunity to expound upon all the things that you have learned through this process, all the things that HCDC has to offer and just make sure that everyone's aware of it and how to access it. So we, we used to do it, I think, in the fall. Um, so maybe it's something to put back on the radar. And I, again, I can't see um, our friend Steve from Planning and Development, but I, I know he's glowing. So thank you. I thank you for that. And thank you for your past work on that. Thank you. In the Shared Service Summit, I was asked to speak there the last one they had. It was, it was awesome. And so we also have to realize that some of those municipalities, villages, et cetera, they want autonomy. They don't understand how shared service can really uh, be advantageous to everybody. And so some of them keep themselves a little isolated because they're doing well, but um, you can help others to do well. And I know when I have gone to the first suburbs meeting, it's not very well uh, attended. Um, you know, there are some people there, the smaller municipalities, but the larger ones that are doing really well don't come uh, very often, but we need to show them how it's advantageous for them to be involved in shared services also. So thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you, commissioners, and thank you for your comments. And um, we will get back to you on all of those questions. Um, just to <laughs> close it out a little bit, what's next? Um, we're, we'll return, at, uh, well actually what we'll do is we'll take your comments and we'll get back to you on those things first. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we will return at a, a future county commissioner's uh, general meeting and uh, make the public aware of a 30 day comment period that we'll put it out there for their comments. Mm -hmm. um, and then once that 30 days is over and we have their comments, we'll get back to you and if we wanna change any of the recommendations. And then finally, um, we'll ask for your approval. Um, and so I appreciate your time and I wanna turn it over to Jeff for his comments as well. Thank you. Uh, no, thank, thank you, Harry. I, I was gonna ask what the next steps were, but I think uh, everything mm -hmm. I, I uh, have planned to say we covered in the conversation and questions um, in particular from Commissioner Reese, so I think we're, we're good. Thank you so Thank much. You okay. Next order of business is the Enterprise Zone Agreement. And Harry, I don't know why you sat down. It's Harry, <laughs> Harry Blanton. <now>. Okay. <laughs> and a few other people that are here to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh -huh. um, so our next item on the agenda is an Enterprise Zone in Forest Park. Uh, we have with us today Paul Brem from the City of Forest Park and Jeff Jacobs with Megan Construction Company. Uh, Megan uh, plans to renovate their existing space of 4,000 square feet and construct an additional 8,000 square feet onto the building uh, so it will more than double their size. Uh, the new investment will total approximately a million dollars with $750,000 in construction and $250,000 in furniture and fixtures. The company will retain 41 jobs and create nine new jobs. The City of Forest Park supports the agreement and has passed a resolution to do that. Uh, the Winton Hills, Wood Schools and Great Oaks have been informed and have not provided any objections. And uh, the company is requesting, uh, and HDC is recommending a 75% tax incentive for eight years. And I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Brem to give you a presentation with more details on the project. Commissioners, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you today about what I think is a, a very, some good news about a great project and a great community. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Forest Park. We're one of since, uh, Hamilton County's more diverse communities. Uh, more importantly, we are seeing for the first time in decades, a very large population growth in the city. Uh, the recent census numbers, apparently we grew about 8% and are now over 20,000 residents, which I believe makes us the second largest city in Hamilton County in terms of population. So we're seeing a lot of good trends in the community, rising home values, rising income. However, we also are seeing a fair number of challenges in our community. I associate, appreciate Commissioner Reese's comments earlier about the first suburbs challenges. We are seeing those in Forest Park. So aging infrastructure, aging, uh, condition of some of our buildings in our commercial districts, uh, underperforming commercial properties. As Harry knows, I bring it up to him 
every time we talk about the SEDS every year, every uh, several years about the, the need to address uh, those types of properties in the community. Our business community represents, and I think a lot of people are surprised by this, more than 500 businesses. The overwhelming majority of those companies are small, medium-sized companies. And our bread and butter in Forest Park, is, as Commissioner Dumas knows from her time in our city, uh, is really those types, of, those types of companies. We start com with companies when they're small, entrepreneurial in nature, help them grow over the course of their, uh, over their cy business cycle, and ultimately hopefully move from leasing space in Forest Park <coughs> to building space in Forest Park. And if you look at a number of our success stories, that's how we built our community. We really focus on business retention and expansion and the redevelopment of commercial property in the city. So this is just a small list of some of the recent projects we've had in the city of Forest Park. Uh, we're very proud of a couple of major projects recently, the $7 million emeritus expansion, renovation and expansion project at Carillon Business Park, followed closely by a $3 million project with Liberty Mutual, which brought their headquarters here from their regional office here from Butler County. So move that into Hamilton County. A number of projects, and again, a number of these are existing Forest Park companies that we had the, pl the, the uh, pleasure of working with over a period of time. That brings us to our project today. Uh, we are working with Megan Construction Company, and I'm sure all of you know, very familiar with Evans Nwankwo, Evans and Catherine, their company. Uh, this is one of the major uh, minority-owned business contractors in greater Cincinnati. They've done a number of high-profile projects in the community. In Forest Park, they just recently completed our Whitten Woods High School uh, expansion project, uh, which was a major project in, in Forest Park. Um, I think one of the things that really separates Megan from, from its competition is its commitment to the community, whether that's Hamilton County, Greater Cincinnati, or even with us here in Forest Park. They take a, a very active role in our community and are very good corporate citizens in Forest Park. Harry mentioned the parameters of the project. Um, obviously, this meets a lot of our goals in terms of being job retention and creation. And also, one of the things we've really focused on in Forest Park recently is in improving the diversity and inclusion of our business community. Uh, the community itself has been, is a very diverse community in terms of its population, but we've really taken an active role the last several years of trying to improve its diversity of the business community itself. So we're working with uh, our partners on trying to get that. And this is consistent with a redevelopment plan that the city put in place several years ago. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, part of our goal is to um, put in place a program that brings underperforming commercial properties back to their highest and best possible use and strengthens the commercial properties we have in the area. This project accomplishes that goal. So it's really a true partnership. Uh, it's a priority for our community. And the city of Forest Park wants to be a true partner in this project. And I think one of the things that uh, I hope that we have a reputation for is when we come to the county seeking assistance, that we put our own dollars on the table as well. We put some skin in the game. Uh, and in this case, not only are we seeking the enterprise zone pro uh, recommendation from the county, but the city of Forest Park used its own redevelopment fund to, uh, to approve a $40,000 redevelopment grant for this project. It is our funds that comes out of our redevelopment campaign and that will be used to help facilitate the project along with the Enterprise Zone Agreement. So we see this as a real commitment for the, the community. And I think the other thing that's important when we talk about Enterprise Zone, we're talking about property tax exemption, a partial property tax exemption that obviously has an impact on our local school district. Uh, Harry mentioned earlier about Winton Woods not having any kind of objection. We actually encourage our applicants to meet with school officials so Jeff Jacobs Evans actually met with our school superintendent and uh, the president of his board of education, and they actually are entering into an agreement with the school district, a separate agreement, which will provide, I think, for mentoring services. And the company actually has a very successful apprentice program that targeted college-age children. I think the goal is to actually expand that and possibly include some of the high school students from our local high school in their very popular and effective apprentice program. So we really try to build a partnership and a relationship, not just dollars, but a relationship between those applicants and the school district because of the importance of this agreement. 
So that gives you a good idea of what the project is. Uh, I am fortunate to be joined here also by Jeff Jacobs from Megan Construction. And Jeff, uh, uh, Director of Business Development for Megan, wanted to invite Jeff up to come up and say a few words, but would certainly be happy to answer any questions the commissioners might have about the project. Certainly, thank you. Hello, I'm Jeff Jacobs, the uh, uh, Director of Business Development for Megan Construction. Thank you for having us today and for considering our project. Uh, we've been around since 1993, have been in the city of Forest Park since 1998. Uh, we want to make a commitment to Forest Park, which I think we, we uh, certainly uh, have done that. Paul's been a great partner working with us uh, on this, and uh, we're really excited about uh, uh, this deal, expanding our company and growing. Although COVID has been very tough on our business, we were able to make it through without any layoffs. Uh, and we're, we're really proud of that. So, um, so we, we've, we've been at about 41 employees. We want to grow. This will help us do that. We, we, we need the extra space, uh, and we want to stay in the city of Forest Park uh, to do our work. So I'll entertain any questions. Thank you so much. We'll open it up for questions. Just in general, I'll just say um, your, your ask, I guess Paul might want to come up, but the ask of the commission seems uh, very reasonable. And it also shows uh, the commitment of Forest Park to put their, as you say, own skin in the game. And so unbelievable that Megan Construction, in the 90s we uh, selected them as uh, business of the month, and they had just done their first development and to think how far they've come, because you see their name uh, everywhere. As it relates to the construction process, renovation and expansion, um, th there are so many elements of construction. This may be not real technical, but as we look at, say, demolition, um, are you guys, who puts out the bid for the different components of this construction? Does Megan do it once given, awarded this uh, task? Yeah, so this project will be managed by us at Megan Construction. Obviously, we have a, a lot of experience Mm -hmm. uh, we plan on doing this and, uh, you know, obviously leaning on our relationships over the years uh, with the subcontractor base. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll do the demolition, mm -hmm. self-perform a lot of the work ourselves. We do have okay. a self-perform division called Megan Works, which mm -hmm. is a part of Megan Construction. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will try and do a lot of this in-house, but we'll also utilize the sub base as well. Mm -hmm. And, and the reason, thank you so much. The reason why we ask, of course, it's a minority business, but in every element we want uh, inclusion and diversity. So thank you so much. I'll open it up for uh, Vice President Reese. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, uh, very much aware of Megan and the work that Megan Construction is uh, doing. Um, got a long history with them, I remember we were redoing the fountain square and it's come a long way and i remember um moving the fountain was a big deal back then now you know they just do a lot on fountain square but back then it was protest and you know um people were one guy wanted to get chained to the to the uh fountain and said don't move the lady uh, but megan came in and really made people feel comfortable promised a good job and they did a real, you all did a great job. And I know there, since that time, you've continued to do a lot of uh, work around um, the community. One, we just talked about before you, how do we keep companies and people here? How do we retain folks to stay here and the talent is here? Um, so one, I, I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, you maintaining and staying in Hamilton County and of course Forest Park. Can you tell me, what is the, where's the area? It's like, uh, you're going to expand where you are and more property there, or how does that? Yes. It, it, it is. It's, the, it's in the Northland Industrial Park, if you're familiar with Forest Park. Yeah. So that's our oldest commercial area. Uh, that's like the original business center for Forest Park along Northland Boulevard. Mm -hmm. um, it is at the very end of this industrial park. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've talked about, one of the reasons I like this project so much, is because Megan's headquarters is actually at the end of this industrial park. Now, this is a very successful area for us. It includes specialty drilling operations, a lot of machining companies, some professional services. But Megan's really the catalyst for development in that area. They were one of the first tenants back there. They're going to triple the size of their existing building. Now, I I've told our team we could probably move this property if we had to 
but we would never get a company the caliber of Megan Construction at this point in the industrial park. And you can kind of see it by the map up there where their location is at the end of the industrial park. This is a real anchor for that area. So that's why this project is so important for us because it gets back to that redevelopment program and keeping us at the highest and best use for a particular piece of property. No, I think that's good. And I'm, I'm happy to see Forest Park um, coming in. And um, I spent a lot of money in Forest Park. You guys take my money a lot. But um, I'm glad to see Forest Park come in because every time I'm there, you guys corner me about, what about Forest Park? We need to get something in Forest Park. Um, so um, again, happy to see this, but also happy that you were able to give a little brief history on what you're trying to do there, the challenges that we have there. And you have so much land. I mean, just acres. We could just get rid of that Forest Fair Mall. I mean, we could really do a lot there. I know that's I was what say, Commissioner I know we all really think about. I could get through one meeting without talking yeah, about I'm sorry, that. I had to put that out there. Now that's one project I'd like to see the Port Authority get on out there on. But uh, that is just so much potential. But there's so much potential in Forest Park, not just there, but just where you're located and the residents. And so you, we definitely don't, don't want to lose business in Forest Park. And I'm happy. Um, that you're bringing something expanding. And I don't think people realize uh, enough, we realize it, but enough of Forest Park, and I talk about this to uh, Mayor Charles Johnson all the time, but understanding the impact that Forest Park has on our entire county. So um, yeah, I just uh, thank you for this presentation and uh, really wanna thank Megan for wanting to stay and not you know pack up and go because you're on the border um and of another county and so we want to keep the business in hamilton county so thank you madam president thank you commissioner treehouse thank you madam president um thank you for being here thank you for the information um i wanted to follow up so the the actual footprint of the expansion is are you going to keep the current building and then build next to it is that the idea yes that's what we're doing so we'll mm -hmm. be, uh, actually where the parking lot is now, we'll be building a new parking lot and the new addition will be going where the parking lot is now. Okay, so, still back in that cul-de-sac back, back there. there. Okay. Yeah, I too, am, I've been actually out to Megan. Um, it, uh, it's been a number of years ago and I really appreciate the work you're doing. You've worked with the county well and so really appreciate that partnership with you guys. Um, so I'm happy to support this project. Um, I too, um, am encouraged about what's going on in Forest Park. Um, you know, Paul, you mentioned population growth, significant population growth, whereas the county overall seemed closer to a 3% increase. What did you say yours was closer it's to close eight? Close to eight. Yeah, what do you, do, can you attribute that to anything in particular? Um, we did start to expand our housing market a little bit uh, the past year. We put in a new residential development of 16 uh, uh, upscale homes uh, that started in the, around the $350,000 range. Those all pre-sold. And I think one of the things that you know, if you know our community, is there's a real true, we like to say it's a very diverse community, but the diversity extends to its housing market, its income level. Um, you know, we've got everything in six square miles, it's amazing in a way. It's kind of this little microcosm of, a, of an entity, but it's, uh, you know, we've got, um, you know, income that all the way from the bottom to the top, housing values from the bottom to the top. So uh, I think the biggest thing is we were able to open up some of our mid-range housing market, um, and we were able to attract some folks into that. But then we've also been able to keep our residents and, and, and put in some step up housing. So I think the combination of those two things is what led to the housing increase, the population increase. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. All right, thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I, I again, am a big fan of Megan Construction, so glad you guys are moving forward and expanding in Forest Park. Paul. So much? Paul. Oh, Paul, sorry. Mm -hmm. I had an additional question as it relates to the income levels rising, and I was trying to figure that one out. You sort of said it when you said you did some new housing coming in because then there was there was a lot of transient population that came from the downtown area that was was mm -hmm. pushed out and I was trying to say I was putting a question mark how is the income levels rising but because of that 
new housing area that think, rose up the I think the new housing and uh -huh. some of the job opportunities that we've put in place uh -huh. we've been able to put in some job creation targets with our existing employers okay. and I think when you look at some of the office workers that have come in uh -huh. a lot of those have moved into the community so I think that's helped to bring some of that income level up okay uh, but at the same time it's like I said, we're, we are seeing those first suburb challenges. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, while we've seen this, this increase, I think it's also because of where we were starting from. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there was some opportunity there to bring in those increases. We've done that now that we're there. We're still got some of the same issues we had before. We still have right. to deal with. So, and, and that affects your residential neighborhoods and, mm -hmm. and you know, from mm -hmm. Silverton, some other places. That's something for Forest Park because of, we're relatively young as a suburb. Those, some of those challenges are just hitting us now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having to work with folks on, you know, home maintenance, property maintenance, and, you know, it's residential and commercial. Those are issues we're starting to deal with. Okay, so we're able to justify that higher income by looking at business of some of the people. I think there was some business, some housing. Businesses. It was a combination of the two. Okay. All right. Commissioner Reese. Um, Madam President, uh, if you don't mind, since we got Forest Park on our mind, uh, we also, as a, a, a board, um, and maybe um, if Jeff could just briefly mention it, uh, one of the issues uh, that uh, Mayor Johnson, uh, while I'm out in Forest Park spending some money, he cornered me on about what about, you know, uh, the county doing something in Forest Park? I know they used to have a clerk of courts uh, facility where you get your license and BNV and that left. And he was saying we're such a large city in the county. Uh, but our board has certainly been looking into that. And I just didn't know if Jeff could briefly, because I know folks from Forest Park are watching, briefly talk about we are, we, we, we definitely haven't forgotten Forest Park and, and yeah. our board is uh, working with, through our administration on some things, possible, possible things. Uh, Madam President, Madam Vice President, yeah, so um, uh, Mr. Bram and I have met several times about this and we're looking at um, a few opportunities. Um, our last conversations uh, around this were very recently actually and uh, we are right now in the in the phase of, of looking at some of the opportunities in Forest Park overlaid with um, just want to make sure that the uh, the traffic from a customer and from a field personnel perspective overlays well with where we might be looking to locate something, that type of thing. So mm -hmm. uh, Paul and I are working closely on it and I'll keep the board uh, apprised as we keep moving forward. I would say Jeff has been really helpful and Harry too. We are working on a state grant to hopefully put in a minority business development center as a part of a redevelopment project that we're working on. Uh, it's still in the talking stages. We're still trying to work through that grant application, but Jeff and his team and Harry and his team have been very supportive in terms of helping us to try to put that project together. Very good. So, Paul, before you leave, uh, Jeff, our next steps as it relates to the Megan construction, renovation, and expansion, what do we need to do? Uh, so, Madam President, there will be a resolution that will come before the board on October 7th relating okay. to this uh, for approval by the board. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I almost Thank you made, for the invitation. Thank hey, you. Hey, Paul, you know we have a running joke. Uh, but w I won't say it now. This is it's a good. <laughs> Can I tell it, Paul? If you'd like to tell it, <laughs> <laughs> we we teased Paul for years because he went to Cincinnati to work for about what three months or something. He said, "I want to come back," and uh, we let him come back. So every time we see him, he said, "Don't forget, we let you come back." So, and that's been how many years ago? It, Twenty it, it's almost. Been a while. Yeah. So anyway, take care. Thank you. All righty. Mm -hmm. All righty, let's move forward. Um, we have item number six, which is executive session. And before we, I make a motion to go into executive session, I would like to open up if there's any comments that our commissioners have. Uh, Vice President Reese, did you have anything before we go into executive session? Uh, Madam President, only thing that would help me, uh, you all may already have it, but if we had some update, I'd like to know I would like to know what's going on with um, Forest Fair Mall, uh, potentially if there's any taxes behind or anything like that, um, because, you know, obviously that is uh, an important part. I know a lot of us have asked over the years and, um, and there's a lot of competition right now. Hamilton, uh, Ohio is building a sports facility that's going to be uh, 
one of the top in the whole country uh, that is coming with um, all kind of amateur sports and basketball and also hotels. And I said, wow, this needs to be in Hamilton County. So uh, we can look into that because I know um, it's unfortunate that uh, some people feel as though if they are a, a, a year or, or less behind in taxes, we're, we're coming and grabbing houses, not us, but you know, the house is grabbed, but sometimes these commercial properties, they can go forever. And some people aren't, you know, we're not aggressive on them, but we're aggressive on other ones, you know, just uh, as we spoke of last week about the Carousel Hotel and the Drake Hotel that the Port Authority came to buy. You know, I got a lot of calls from people asking if somebody's behind $160,000 in taxes, why wasn't that property taken and gone into foreclosure and you could get it for 50,000 or 100,000? Why would you give them a million, 1.5 million plus pay their taxes? But then in other communities, if you're behind 1,000 or 1,500 or $5,000, you're getting a letter, you better pay or we're getting ready to take your property. So my point is, I'd like to know, are they up to date on their property out there? And if so, uh, if not, well, why aren't the tools being used as used on maybe some of the smaller businesses, smaller property owners? Um, because I think we all agree that that property uh, definitely needs to be uh, developed and used and certainly is a, uh, an obstacle if you will, for Forest Park. So maybe we could get something in writing just to update us what's going on with that property, what's, a, what's happening with it, um, so that at least we're aware of what's happening there. Yeah, uh, Madam President, Thank you. Madam Vice yes. President, mm -hmm. um, I spoke with uh, Mr. Brum the other day about this, so I do have an update that I can provide to you uh, uh, offline. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Driehaus. I have nothing further. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to go into executive session pursuant to RC section 121 dot 22G4 to discuss collective bargaining. Second. Yes. Yes. 